My name is Eric Van Horn. I bought my first franchise in my 20s, and since then, I've owned six brands with 25 stores in eight states. I've also helped a thousand people find the right franchise for them. People like us who are not cut out for the nine to five and like to work smarter, not harder. How do we find the right franchise, buy it, grow it, sell it, and how do we do it in a way to own the business without it owning us? Those are the questions, and I'm on a mission to give you the answers. Welcome to Franchise Secrets. Welcome to the Franchise Secrets Podcast with your host, Eric Van Horn, here with today's guest, Zach Lease. And Zach's been in the Franchise Tribe Mastermind. And just uh, as we started the Scale Mastermind, he joined that one. And I wanted to bring him in here because he's got a super interesting story. Now, he doesn't think it's that interesting, but I think it's interesting. I think a lot of other people will find it fascinating. He started out as a in a business that he owned with his dad as a mom and pop business, bought a franchise, an emerging brand, a very new franchise, emerging brand, took it to from one location to two locations, bought out a failing location, and then he's still growing that brand, but he's also found a way to be a vendor to that franchise brand. And so I want to get into all of that with you, man. Welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Privilege Absolutely. To be on here. Um, first of all, like, tell me about the mastermind. Like, how has the mastermind been helpful to you? Like, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts around that for anybody that is not in a mastermind, not around franchisees like that? What have you found helpful? The franchise mastermind has been awesome for me. Um, as far as broadening my thinking, um, that's been a big, big thing for me seeing all these different brands these different people, how they're scaling things, um, how they're, everybody's different, but it's all, there's all systems and processes and everybody um, operates differently, but learning about all the different brands and how everybody runs them has been really, really interesting to me. And then just the dialogue back and forth with other franchisees. And even though it may not be the same type of franchise, it's just um, hearing how they manage their business has been awesome. And a lot of my eye opening to me about the different areas and stuff. Dude, I hear that a lot. And I, I'm excited to have you in there. I don't know that everybody knows that you like became a vendor to your franchise. I think that is something <laughs> a lot of franchisees need to start thinking about right now. I mean, we've hit, we're in COVID right now. People are, are pivoting, shifting, doing things different. You need to think differently. And I think if more franchisees thought of ways to serve their franchise or as a vendor, like, I think there's so much possibility with that. My, my co-host at Franchise Story, Brian Holmes, did that with the marketing company, started his own marketing company as a vendor because he saw a need and he did it. And now he has a large company. So anyway, I'm excited to get into the vendor aspect of that. And I know that you're growing that, but let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to how you got your start in business and then how you got into franchising. Yeah, so I guess kind of origin story for me a little bit. Um, we grew up in outside of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So like where the Civil War was fought, big battle. Um, and we lived in a little rural town like outside of Gettysburg. And so um, very rural, very backwoods, like there was not a lot of people around. And so um, I always was looking for like little businesses. Um, it sounds like you're talking about where I live right now is what, yeah. is what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah, really. <laughs> sounds like when you say little town, my little town, I think it's grown from 7,000 to 10,000. When you say little town for yourself, how big was that? Or small was that little town? Uh, probably about 7,000. Yeah, give or take. Ah, I mean, they're okay. really... You were talking, okay, backwoods. I remember you say backwoods. I'm not going to forget that. So you grew up <laughs> backwoods, little town, and keep going. <laughs> so the closest, the closest real town to uh, the closest town, honestly, to us was probably <laughs> 25, 30 minutes away on either direction. And so um, always looking for little businesses to do. Um, I used to uh, skateboard. That was kind of my passion for the longest time. And so we travel all the different contests up and down the east coast and then um, get sponsors and all that kind of stuff like that but I would always take all the used products that I would get from different sponsors or uh, that I had left over and then I would always try and sell it and so we'd always start these little things where we'd sell it to everybody around us that needed stuff that was used and they could get it cheaper and it kind of migrated into um, business with my grandfather and my dad and so 
Um, my grandfather had started a log and timber frame business where we built custom homes. Um, and so we would travel all over um, the four state area around us, probably like a two and a half hour radius, building these houses, um, big houses, big dream houses. The typical customer was retiring and this was like their forever house. So um, they were pretty big, uh, took a long period of time and they were very rural. So we'd be like way out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> building these houses. And uh, did that and my grandfather decided he wanted to retire. Um, and so before that, um, probably about 16 or so, I had come on full time. Um, I was always homeschooled because I traveled so much with doing the skateboarding and the contest and the circuits and that type of stuff. And so around 16, um, they needed help and nobody that was experienced to do it. And I had grown up doing it. And so it was an easy transition. So I was doing night school from 16 until 18 when I graduated and just working full time in the business with them and uh grandfather wanted to retire five or six years later and so me and my dad bought him out and took over the business and ran that with him for uh six seven eight years give or take and then uh got into franchising we bought our first franchise. so making good uh, money so you had that did you invest your own money into it at that time or did you get a did you have a loan um into the, Mine into was more the sweat equity. You sweat equity, perfect. And yeah. and um, yep. and so partner with your dad, then the business I'm sure did well. And so um, you're doing well as a you know as a builder, basically building you know yep. high end custom custom homes out in the middle of nowhere in places like where I live. And <laughs> and then um, and then this is now going into how you got your first franchise. So yep. go yep. straight into that. So with the custom home building, there was, um, we were a dealer for them. So there was a product that we were a dealer for. So we would, it was set up similar to a franchise. You'd have regions and areas that we would cover. And so that was kind of my first little taste into what that looked like. There was a main office and then they had different regions across the country and we had a region that we would supply. And so um, we had went me and my wife took her to a date night at a local uh, bar with some friends and did this uh, like wine and paint night kind of thing. Um, so we were all sitting around, we're all painting these canvases together. Um, There's probably 15, 20 people there. And there was a lady like leading the whole thing. And we got done, we had a great time and we left. And as we were driving, I remember her saying, um, why don't we do something like this, but do it on wood. It'll be so different. We could do it on wood. We could go around to different little fire departments and like set stuff up and bars and stuff. And I was like, I don't know. Let's, let's do some competition <laughs> research. <laughs> so uh, two or three days later, she's like, Hey, I found this little company out in Wisconsin that um, just started franchising like two weeks ago. And, you know, <laughs> here's the number. What do you think? And I was like, well, I guess I'll give them a call. So <laughs> I gave them a call. And uh, two weeks later, we were in Wisconsin doing a discovery day with the owners and uh Week after that, we signed our franchise agreement. And within four weeks after that, we had opened our first location in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So you are a decision yeah. maker. That is, that's <laughs> awesome. That's fast, but you know, you are, I mean, successful people are decision makers. Successful people take action. They don't just wait. They just don't, you know, research and research and research and research some more. They they see it, they know it, and they, they take action. Um, so what franchise number were you, were you like one of the first, probably the first 10 for sure, but no, they had, um, some corporate locations. They had started out doing the corporate model and then mm -hmm. they had did a licensing model okay. and kind of turned it into the franchise model. So I think when we well, got let's in pause there, there had... for a second, because that's common for just to give anybody some that's out there that's common in franchising because people start out as a corporate model and franchising is a way for a friend for a business owner to scale. And so people get into, uh, they have a successful business model um, or should be successful business model. They want to scale it. Then they realize they don't want to scale it by adding more and more locations to have hundreds of locations themselves around the country with all of the, of that uh, it entails, you know, just a headache with in terms of personnel. So they don't want to do that. They typically start licensing that because it's easier than franchising. Then they realize you can't legally continue to license it if you are acting like a franchise. And this is where my mm -hmm. friend Bader's Coolian made a mistake with Fit Body Boot Camp. He started to do that. And we went into that on one of the episodes with Bedros. 
but this is very common out there. So people that are thinking about licensing as a way to scale, you need to talk to a franchise attorney to see, don't talk to a licensing attorney, talk to a franchise attorney to see if that's really how you want to scale and, and the, and the dangers that come along with it, because there may or may not be dangers and you just have to stay within parameters. But if you do want to scale and you are naturally going to cross over into franchising, do that from day one versus having a licensing deal and then going into franchising. It just, it's just a, not a very clean way to do it. So you had this, this is what happened to you, Zach. You, you went into this franchise or probably had a similar story of what I just outlined. They had some licensees and now you were the first franchisee. And so continue, pick up where, pick up from there. But I wanted to bring that to the audience. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, opened that in July of 2017. Um, we had that for, from July to uh, February of 2018. And uh, at that point, the franchisor reached out and said, there's a couple other people that are interested in your area. Are you interested in opening another location? And I was, wasn't at that point, but. Uh, we didn't have, we didn't want any way to encroach on the area that we had mapped out. And so I said, we're going to open our next one. So um, March, 2018, we opened another one um, about 20 minutes outside the Capitol. So uh, outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, there's a little suburb in Mechanicsburg. And we opened that one up, mm -hmm. um, operated that one from uh, March of 2018. And then in October, we had um, the opportunity to purchase a failing franchise in uh, Maryland. So about 45 minutes, the other direction from us. Um, and so, so from, from where you are now, like where the home base is to the different locations, is it ones, how, how far apart are they like driving? Uh, so time? about an hour, hour and 10 minutes, give or take, um, depending on how you go to them, but, uh, Gettysburg is kind of the center and then Mechanicsburg would be an hour North and then Hagerstown would be about an hour and 15 minutes. South. Okay. So that's significant. I mean, that's, and, and then, so you still have, was that, was that failing location? Was that a licensed person or is that a franchise person? That was a franchise person. Um, they had, they had opened it a month before we had opened our Mechanicsburg location and they had actually come into it from owning one of those paint night locations mm -hmm. where they would um, like a licensed version of that where they would go around and do it and so they thought it would be an easy transition but the i think the inventory side of things and the system and processes and having employees was a little bit different than just doing a single that's like a, a solo yeah that's a good point because you think you know i'm sure they saw similarities with it you yeah. know and yeah. then realizing that it's really not so similar as you start to look at the mechanics of the business and what, what the franchise or does and doesn't do, or the, or like, you know, like you said, inventory and things like that. So is there anything else that you, that you saw like they were maybe weaker on or didn't do right compared to you besides those types of things? Um, I think that was a lot of it, the systematic part of it. Um, like things need, like we do a lot of prep work in advance before the events and mm -hmm. they had, noticed that they attend uh, when I came in and kind of did like a overview with them for a week or two before we took it over just to see how they ran things. They had tend to wait to the very last minute. <laughs> and so they were constantly running short on inventory and they had to tell the customer, Hey, I'm sorry, we don't actually have the thing that you had registered for, or um, they didn't have enough staff because there was people that gotten in, but they never put another staff member on for that event. And so they'd be short staffed and customers wouldn't get the help and attention they were uh, asking for. And so they had a bad experience and then it just kind of trickled down from there. So when you were looking at that, buying that, and this is just, you know, for anybody that's looking at buying out an underperforming location, because, you know, let's think about going into validation a little bit here, but we'll stick, we'll stay steer clear from validation. We'll just go <laughs> into, because if someone was to validate with you versus them, they're going to hear two different stories. They're going to hear the, the thing yeah. doesn't work, or they're going to hear the thing works really well. And really the difference is not the franchise or, or necessarily location, but the, the difference in this case was the franchisee. Right. And, and, and so with, were you just looking at buying it from a value standpoint or were there certain things that you realized that you wanted it because it was at the right location or is it because you knew they were doing things wrong? Like what was it that was attractive to you? 
I think the metric of scale for us was the biggest attraction mm. for me. Um, it had a region that I wanted to go in. It wasn't the exact location I would have placed it in or the least area that I would have signed the lease in. But the fact that we would gain another region and somebody else as competition wouldn't come in and take that mm. area from us was a big point. Um, my thought process was I'll be able to also purchase more inventory at a cheaper cost because I have more of it going out also. And so just looking at all those things, um, just it just made sense. It fit fit the all the points that we were had pain points at that we wanted to add as we were scaling and it was in our right location. How do you have it right now? Like what's the what's the employee infrastructure look like? How do you so manage all right that? now? Um, there is a studio manager, um, so we call them studios. Um, and so there's a studio manager that's in charge of um, operations in the studio at each of the locations. Um, I, I'm their direct point of contact, so they would report to me. Um, and then from the studio manager, we have what's uh, an instructor. Um, so she's the one that would lead the events. Um, she's like a key holder. Um, and then when she's in there, typically the studio manager is not. So she's considered the on staff manager at that point. Um, and then she's re responsible for six to eight employees that are under her that are assisting customers. And so she'll give direction and lead the event while the customer is there. Um, and then she'll uh, make sure that the employees are doing what they're supposed to do as they're assisting customers, uh, making sure that customers are getting what they need. And then she's in charge of supervising the cleanup and resetting of all the um, materials and stuff for the next event. Before so explain, you know, I did, and I didn't ask you this in, be, in the beginning, like explain what it actually is when you talk about the event yeah. and the product and all that. <laughs> I, I skipped over that because I know it, but um, bring some clarity to that. Yeah. So what we do um, is we hold workshops. And so a workshop is um, an event in our storefront. Um, the customer experience starts on the website. They would go to our website. We have a large calendar on the website, has dates and times of events. Um, the customer would then register for what event they'd like to attend. Um, at that point, they would pick out their project is what we call it. So it might be a, a shadow box. It might be a, um, a porch planner, a frame, a box, um, coat rack. We have all different kinds of projects. We have 450 different options to choose from. And so they would pick whatever project they'd like. And then at that point, it, um, some of them have personalization on them. So it might be like um, their last names, like the Smith home or like um, our kitchen, that type of stuff like that. And so they would input that into the website, um, what that personalization is. Um, when they pay and complete the registration, we get an email of what they've registered for. Um, it goes into the back office system. And then when the um, manager, the studio manager logs in, she sees everybody that's uh, attending that event on say Friday. And she'll say, oh, there's 12 people. Here are the stencils um, that need to be created to fit those projects. Because when the customer comes in, they'll then paint and stain and stencil on um, the design onto their project. And so um, the the manager then goes to work creating the stencils, making sure we have everything contacting the customer if there's any missing information, that type of thing. And then when the customer comes in on Friday for their workshop, um, they're greeted by uh, the instructor at the front desk. Uh, we have seating charts done before each of the workshops so we know where that customer is supposed to be seated at. Um, we send them back to whatever table their project is at with the rest of their group if they attended with the group. Um, and then when that customer gets back there, they're greeted by an assistant, a workshop assistant. Um, that workshop assistant takes their coat, their purse, hangs it up for them, offers them a complimentary tea, water, soda, or coffee, um, shows them some add-on designs that we offer as an upsell for $15, um, and then gets them all situated. Um, and then the instructor, the manager on duty comes in and she starts the workshop. And the workshop is uh, two and a half to three hours long. Uh, 10 steps and they take this raw piece of wood that they picked out online and turn it into the finished product. And so they'll go through all 10 steps, picking out their stain color, picking out their paint color, um, stenciling their project, waxing and sealing their project. And then they actually take that finished product home with them that evening um, to then hang on their wall. That's really cool. And it's board and brush. If you want to look at it, it's board, board and brush. And brush. 
um, just Google that and you will, and you'll find it, but you know, it's the stuff that everyone hangs on their wall. It's the stuff that people have on their office. It's the stuff that, you know, businesses have, you know, like the coffee shops have on, on their wall. So it's really cool. Um, I want to get into the next phase of, of things on your new business as a franchise or vendor. Like how did, when did that come about? How did that come about? Oh my, so with this, there is a lot of different products because there's a lot of different selections for the customers to choose from. And so um, there's stuff that gets pre-built ahead of time. So the customer doesn't have to do that when they show up, uh, the project's sitting at their spot, ready for them to start the, the choices of staining and painting and all that kind of stuff. And so um, we were building shadow boxes, we were building coat racks, we were building planners, all this kind of good stuff um, ahead of time for the customer. So we build it, stock it in inventory, and then we never know what somebody's going to register for when they come in to attend. And it gives us inventory to pull from to then place for that customer when they come in. So um, I was doing it all myself when we had one location. Um, I was building, coming in um, after work. I would build till late at night. And that way we'd have inventory for the next week and kind of keeping up with it that way. When we started the second location, um, it got to be too much. I couldn't do it anymore. And so my grandfather, who was uh, retired, um, I took an old two-car garage we had and converted it into a wood shop and asked him if he wanted to, to come in and build for me for two days a week. <laughs> uh, he did that for six months or so. Um, and then my it got so busy, he couldn't keep up with it. Had my dad come in part-time and help <laughs> him with the extra overflow. And then we had purchased our third location and they were both uh, full-time at that point, keeping up with it. Um, probably another three or four months after that, I had the bright idea that if I have this problem, I'm sure all other 270-some board of brushes in the country It took you do. four months to realize that? <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, well, let's, let's offer it to everybody else. So we started out small. We offered it to uh, three to four local to kind of test it and see how mm -hmm. um, we were able to keep up with with manufacturing it for them and the quality and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they, they were very pleased. And so a few months after that, uh, we launched a website and offered it with the franchisor's blessing to all other franchisees in the system. And so uh, we were offering um, the ability to purchase uh, all the wood that they would need, either uh, a project cut to size or assembled and built and ready to place at the customer's station when they came in. And so something they could order inventory consistently and um, stock in there without having to do it themselves. And so, and so um, everybody was doing it themselves before, is this how it was? There was a lot. Uh, there was one other vendor that was doing something similar, but not to the level that we were, they were offering a lower grade product um, that was had issues and stuff to mm -hmm. it. And the ordering process wasn't very fluid. And um, a lot of times, I, coming from the construction background, I knew um, how shipping worked, how freight worked, that kind of stuff. And so um, we were able to make the process a lot easier for delivery and more user-friendly for people who didn't have ever had that experience before. And so it was a, it was a nice, easier way of getting their orders delivered in a way that they could understand and get. All businesses so, is, is there's a problem that's getting solved by somebody. I mean, the, you know, and so many times we as business owners see problems as problems and wish somebody would fix it so we can run our businesses better. But you saw a problem in the franchise and came up with a solution. And then the solution turned into another, a complete new business. And you can do so many things with that now. I mean, you know, you can, there's a lot of different ways that you can, that you can go. Um, how was it having that conversation with the franchisor? What, and what, like, what advice would you have for somebody that's wanting to be a vendor and might have something like some do's or don'ts talking to the franchisor? Um, make sure that everybody is on the same page. Uh, make sure that you're meeting their quality standards. That was a big part. They wanted, didn't want us to offer something that was not meeting their, um, re the project required sizing or wood used or, materials supplied it all needed to follow within the system which makes sense for uh, making everything um, symmetrical across all locations and so uh, that was probably the biggest point they just wanted to make sure that we were following the system as far as 
giving the correct product to other studios to then use and offer. Um, but they were very supportive once they kind of got the vision of what we were trying to accomplish. Um, they, they actually sent out a mass email and said, hey, everybody, here's another vendor that you can now choose from, um, give you more options and people to pick from. So how long ago did they send that email out? Basically, how long ago were you that, that approved vendor? Uh, probably about a year now. Uh, okay. And then how many, like what percentage of the franchisees are buying from you or number oh, percentage yeah. or number? Um, I think we've serviced 148 the last time I counted. Wow. Um, and there's 270 in the system as of now. Wow. And so, um, a good, a good variety of them. A lot of, a lot of them, um, have purchased six to eight times from us at this point. And so, we've become their preferred vendor. And so we get uh, monthly orders from them. And so we're on the East coast, but we ship everywhere. So we've shipped stuff up to Washington state and up, uh, we have three locations in California that we ship to on a regular basis. And so, um, yeah, all over the country. So what are you thinking now? Are these, um, you know, what's, what are your goals? Uh, you know, like, what do you focus on? You focus on the vendor aspect of it. You focus on getting more locations. Like what, what, what's 2021 going to look like for you? Um, well, early 2020, we were in the process of opening our fourth location uh, for board and brush. And we actually were in the middle of lease negotiations the week uh, COVID hit and everything got shut down. So we had our first little boy born, uh, COVID hit, and, and we were negotiating leases um, all in that first, uh, like the last week in March, I guess it was when all that went down. And so I put the brakes on the fourth location. So let's, let's see how things pace out the rest of the year. And so the goal going into 2021 would be to um, revisit that fourth location um, and then continue to grow the vendor side of it. So uh, we have, four full-time employees now in the warehouse that we, we leased uh, about eight months ago. We uh, leased an 8,200 square foot warehouse and moved so operations. So two car garage to 8,000 plus square feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of space now. It's a movement store. We can uh, purchase material at a more volume of material to get better pricing that we can then pass down to the franchisees. Um, and so that way they get a product that's higher quality at a better rate. And so um, looking to grow that, expand that, service more locations. Um, we also wanna uh, maybe look into also offering startup packages for new locations that are starting, uh, maybe all their trade dress items pre-built that we could ship their first initial order of product along with their trade dress items that the franchisor requires to them so they can get their store more or less in a box. And so mm -hmm. they could open in two weeks versus uh, taking two months to open. And so that's and something- Before we started recording, um, we were talking about Jeff Fenster, who was on here, the founder of yeah, Everbowl. Yeah. And and I was just on the, you know, a new uh, social thing called Clubhouse. Do you know about Clubhouse? Are you on Clubhouse yet? You heard of Clubhouse? I, what, I have not, Man. what's that? Clubhouse is- <laughs> We're going to look back a year from now and you're going to be like, I remember talking to Eric about Clubhouse and now everybody <laughs> knows about Clubhouse or it might be like that nobody knows about Clubhouse because it was a <laughs> cool thing for a month or two and nothing happened with it. But um, anyway, I was with Jeff um, on uh, this thing called Clubhouse. It's kind of like this new social social platform um, that's all audio and you go into uh, rooms where you can interact with uh, different people. And it's really, really cool. It's an invite. Um, you can sign up for it on a, an Apple device and then you have to be invited in by somebody. So anyway, uh, there's somebody else in the, that's in our mastermind that is, um, he's, he's in scale and he's also just got into Clubhouse, I believe. Um, but anyway, Jeff was in there talking about what he talked about on their podcast, that vertical integration, being able to, um, you know, cut down on costs and deliver really good product. And there's just, you know, when you think about what Jeff Fenster has done, he's been able to help, help his franchisor as the franchisor <clears throat> just get, um, he's created more businesses, more revenue opportunities, more net income opportunities, and, and, a, and a lot more value for his franchisees. So any of us franchisees out there could be vendor, a vendor for our, uh, for a franchise or, 
Um, we just need to be, you know, just get it. It's a mindset thing, man. It's a mindset thing. It took you four months to realize there's bigger need for this that I could do, do it as a <laughs> vendor. And there's a really big opportunity here. And I think there's, you know, I remember being at Liberty Tax way back in the day thinking, man, being a franchise vendor is the place to be. The grass is always greener. But I think there's something really interesting about being a vendor to franchise into the franchise or community because you can do so many different things. I mean, you could even be a vendor to other franchise or just offering certain things to them that they that they need that would be a, a good fit for their brand. So, um, but anyway, what did you learn from Jeff? What would any any takeaways from Jeff that you learned from him um, that are helping you as you grow the vendor side of things? Yeah. So that, that actually, that podcast was very inspirational for me. Just listen to how he did it and how he built that whole system. Um, he had given the franchisees the opportunity to send them a floor plan of what their location looks like. Uh, they go to work designing the location and building all the items in it that are required. And then they then ship it to the franchisee to then open up and set up. And so I took their I don't remember the exact numbers, but the average opening down significantly from what it was typically taking to somebody to open a location, they could open it a lot quicker, um, significantly quicker. And so uh, when after listening to that, I got to thinking about the same concept and I know the average location um, for us takes four to six months to open. And so from franchise agreement signed to actually opening the door and a lot of that two to three months of that is build out just uh, mm -hmm. renovations, making sure they have all the trade dress items that are required. Um, there's a check in desk that's required. There's a, a bar that's required because um, all of the locations are either BYOB or they actually have alcohol licenses. And so um, there's a required bar, there's required um, coat racks and certain shelving units and all that kind of stuff. There's tables that the customer works on that's there's a certain dimension and size that's required um, of those as well. And so um, if you are not familiar with it or you're hiring a contractor to come in and do it, you have to relate all that information to them to make sure that that gets built to the correct specs or you have to go back and rebuild it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So thinking through all that, um, if we could offer a universal way for somebody to order all their, all their trade dress items that are already built to spec, um, it would save them a lot of headache and work on their side of it. So that's kind of the avenue we'd like to pursue and kind of look into um, the opportunity there as well. Offering. And that's, that's how we as franchisors, you know, as, as I'm um, building out Mighty Dog Roofing as a franchisor, we want, we want our franchisees to get open for businesses as quickly as possible, especially, you know, if someone's in the, the franchise or in the retail type space, it takes so long to get open. So anything you can do to shortcut that process it means you start making money faster and the faster that you start making money as a franchisee, the, 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 the less uh, just drag you are in the franchise or of going through the process before they start making money. They need to start making money off of your royalties. You need to have revenue coming in for them to make, to make money. And that's how this whole thing works. So the franchise or wants you to get open up. So if you're thinking about being a vendor of a franchise or, um, you know, think about how you can make things faster and easier for them. All these vendors that we have at Mighty Dog Roofing are, are making things easier for the franchisee or faster for the franchisee. That's and an easier for the franchisor. So ease and, and speed is really what we're looking for. And then obviously being a really good vendor, providing a really good product at a, at a really good price, you know, or a fair price. Um, because that's what you need. Thanks so for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. You Whether you're watching or listening, you please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. Right. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise yeah, to franchising um, your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com. A couple, couple other opportunities that I'm investigating uh, at the moment, but uh, nothing concrete, all, all preliminary. We, we never stop, do we? I mean, there's like, like one the of the book. things that we talked about doing inside the Franchise Tribe mastermind the scale part of it that you're in 
is getting in some franchise wars that everybody's looking at. And then um, one of our members said, Eric, and then you can just grill them for two hours. And <laughs> I, you know, because I've investigated so many of them. And so I think we'll do that. So let's just keep in touch and see what franchise opportunities we want to bring inside the, the, the hot seat into the scale mastermind. So we can uh, see, uh, see what we can uncover the good and the bad. Um, but that's it. The devil's in the detail on all of these, all of these brands. You look at one of the takeaways from this episode is getting a, buying a, a, your third location, which was an underperformer. And, and there's, I think there's going to be a lot of that right now with COVID and just people that, that, um, are just struggling for different reasons. And they might be struggling for reasons like what you're dealing with now. They might have, have a job that's taken their, that's, that's providing the income and they've taken their eye off of the franchise, but it might be something different. It might be something that's, that, that is a location that you can't overcome or something that you can't overcome. So my advice to anybody out there that's looking at getting an underperforming location, there's, there's a reason why it's underperforming. Many of many times it is the franchisee and it's not something wrong with the business model or the franchise, but you just really need to know what you're getting into um, on, on something like that. So any advice that you would have for anybody that's looking at buying out an existing location before I let you go? Um, for us, it would definitely devils in the details. Uh, just looking through how it's, run the staffing that's hired uh, how it's managed how they're how they're treating it uh, what the overall feeling is that they're that they're putting out there to the customer um, we it was challenging for a couple different reasons for us for our side of it um, like we had to go in and retrain all the staff we had to we didn't want to close down so we had to bring staff from another location to cover that location as we had took it over to make sure that we could retrain the existing staff the way we wanted them to be trained. Um, so that way they were offering the customer experience that we had um, set as a precedence for all the other locations. And so I think that was that was a very, that was a big challenge for us is just watching how the staff was managed and uh, not necessarily that they wanted to do it incorrectly, they were just trained incorrectly and just yep. needed the opportunity to know the correct way that we wanted it done. Um, and then just, uh, Inventory kind of all it kind of all goes, trickles down from there, but just um, the way that inventory is handled and the way the customer service side is handled. I mean, at the end of the day, um, if you have very poor customer service, your customers will make the business. And so if <laughs> if they're unhappy, they're not going to come back. And so it doesn't matter what you do; it's not a business if you don't have customers. So um, just making sure that the reputation of the location, and not only the brand but that lo specific location that the integrity and the way it's managed and the customer service side of it is handled correctly. And when you take it over that you have the right um, feeling and that you're trying to give the right attitude towards the customers as you take it over that it's a new, it's a new ownership and a new way of handling things. Yep. Uh, that is great advice. I love talking about this type of stuff because a lot of us are going to have opportunities to be taken over existing locations like that. Uh, we talked a lot about the Franchise Tribe Mastermind. We talked about the Franchise Secrets Facebook group. The Franchise Secrets Facebook group is free. Just go on to FranchiseSecrets.com. The bottom of that website, you'll see join the Facebook group or just go to Franchise Secrets group. Dot com and you will uh, be able to have access there and it's free, it's easy, and there's a lot of value that goes in there. Um, and then if you are interested in looking at the mastermind that I have and people like Zach are in it, go to franchisetribe.com, franchisetribe.com, reach out to me on social channels and, and uh, message me if you want to have a conversation about it. But man, thanks again for coming on today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.